bytes of the PDF. Yeah, so and currently this current edition of the financial plan is also being recorded. So we can probably have a recap after this time out to understand quite some things better. So inshallah, we shall start the program fully and um, we'll be calling on one of our very preferred and um, distinguished uh, member uh, in person of engineer Abdukoni Aditunji to take us through the opening prayer. So I hereby pass on the Ms. Bumak to engineer Abdukoni. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All thanks, glorification and acknowledgement belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has guided us to today, who has given us the opportunity to uphold one of the quality of a Muslim, which is to plan. And indeed, we are planning and we're also learning on how to get the planning done. We pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to guide us. We pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the section a fruitful one for us. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it hujata lana and not hujatan alayna. Uh, for the speaker, we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should guide his tongue, his thoughts, and his intellect, and in the aspects in which he is trying to guide us towards. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us understand it better than he will put it, and in any mistakes from his mind, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive his shortcomings in that regard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this beneficial for us and grant everyone of us financial capability. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enrich everyone of us. Obana atina fiddina hasana. وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا ذاب النار اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا بما ينفعنا وزدنا إلما وزدنا تقوى وزدنا صبرا وزدنا مال سبحانك الله وحمدك نشأر على إلى إلى أنت ونستكفيك عن تبيني آمين زاكم الله خيرا for that some very um knowledge with an opening prayer. We ask Allah to truly make it an future for us, not taking some duty of reckoning. Amen. Uh, so very quickly, we uh, shall, before we invite our esteemed speaker to take us through uh, the topic of this session, I would, it's important we get to know him better. For those who uh, joined um, one of the previous sessions we had, we had him you know, currently to take us through a very exciting topic and and I feel it's important that we also still learn more from him, from his wealth of knowledge. For those who don't know our distinguished speaker very well, so we shall be calling on um, Adi Amino Alakabalogun to just take us through citations so we get to have a glimpse of who exactly our guest speaker is. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. Um, my name is Amino Alakabalogun. And I welcome everyone from Las Mega and all participants to this virtual webinar. I am also honored to welcome our guest speaker to this occasion. The topic before us today, this afternoon, is financial planning, which will be <clears throat> discussed by our distinguished guest speaker. <clears throat> no other than Mr. Yedi Jibalogun. <clears throat> um, Ms. Ayode Jibalogun is a Nigerian entrepreneur, commodity trader, and CEO Ethex, Nigeria's first private sector commodities exchange and tech-enabled agriculture company. He is a member, board of trustees of Association of Security Exchange in Nigeria. He serves on the board of Capital Market Development Fund. Mr. Ede Jibalogun was born in Ijebu Ode, Ogun State. He holds a diploma in heavy equipment engineering from Penn Foster University, Scranton. And he also holds a bachelor in engineering in mechanical engineering from Lagos State University. He furthered his education at Lagos Business School, where he earned an MBA and IESC Business School, Spain. Mr. Radej Balegun began his career as an analyst with Unilever Nigeria PLC and later became an associate at the real partners where he contributed to the development of 
Nigeria's Agricultural Transformation Plan in 2011. He was the regional director, Africa Exchange Holdings for West Africa. And then he became the country manager for Apex Commodities, Apex Commodities Exchange Limited in July, 2014. He was also appointed CEO of Apex in 2019. And her guest speaker is married to Hajia Holoakemi Balogun, a, a medical doctor, and together they have two beautiful children. Thank you. Now, Nizak Mulakaran for taking us through this citation. Uh, that was really you know, inspiring. And um, we would all confirm that our guest speaker is indeed someone that um, we all look forward to. And when we check online and we see probably some of his posts and all, we are always inspired and we are really glad to have him as uh, one of us. So we are glad to have him as a guest speaker to take us through the topic as earlier stated, financial planning. And I'm sure while he's giving his um, presentation, we we'll most likely have questions. So let us do well to um, feel free to note down our questions. And uh, after taking us through this presentation, we would um, create enough time to take in questions as much as we can. So far, we are still within the time limit. So I want to uh, humbly and respectfully invite our speaker, um, engineer Ayudeji Balogun, to take us through uh, this session. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi um, it's indeed a pleasure to be here again and um, greetings to all my brothers and sisters in Islam. Um, I see my Egbons in the room, my colleagues uh, that we finished from last week with campus at the same, you know, the same year. Uh, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Too. And then uh, many more. Um, uh, it's pleased to be here and to be sharing this. Uh, we pray that Allah guides us. We pray that Allah puts barak and risk and Afia in all our endeavors. And uh, we pray that uh, we continue to prosper, uh, not just in this world, but in this world and in the air after. Um, indeed, I think the first thing I like to talk about when we talk about financial uh, is the fact that there is no formula to, um, to, to, to these things in life. Um, Allah has predestined uh, our our coder uh, and we'll continue to work within that fines and then continue to pray for him uh, to give us the best, um, you know, the, and make make the things that have been written even better off for us and easier. Uh, but um, there's no, um, I'm an Ijebu man, so pardon me to to go in Yoruba. They say your little koja kada rai is a very apt way to put it that, you know, you can't also more than your predestination. Uh, but within that finds, Allah has given us many ways by which we can continue to engage him and act um, and ask him for, for better month in, uh, betterment in this life and the day after. But also he's given us, a, you know, the month of Ramadan, uh, Lelato Qadri and Tajud and many other venues. So um, what we'll be talking today is not out of the context of the spiritual guidance in fact, um, you know, one of my mentors will say that there are three ingredients in success. So one of that is um, luck, uh, uh, which, which comes by prayer in most times. The second is being ready. And then the, the, the third is having the right opportunities. Uh, when these three things combine together, you have what is called serendipity meaning that it just looked like it was meant to be and it happens and you're able to take advantage of that opportunity and make the best of it. So what we'll be giving are just a few guides, nothing that we probably not have heard about, but just a reminder that within these norms and certain things, uh, we will be, it should be able to uh, make a better financial plan for ourselves. The focus of the presentation is personal finance, so it talks about you as an entity, you and your family. 
Uh, but a lot of the learnings can also be applied to you and the business or you and, um, you know, your immediate Uma. I would like to also just, as we engage in the chat room, um, the, for us to just put it there, if we signify, if we have a financial plan. When I say financial plan, it's first, what is the number, um, you know, that you aspire to have? What, how much, how much sort of risk or wealth or cash um, do you aspire to want to have in life? Do you have it written down? Uh, and do you have a time frame written to it? Just as an indication, if you have or you don't, if you care to share, let's know so that we have a sense of, um, and I want to use to get the sense of our sort of um, understanding of financial planning as a, philo as a, as a phenomenon. So if, if you're on the chat group, please um, signify with a smiley or a text if you have a financial plan. And if you don't, please don't feel, um, don't be shy to also let us know that you don't. I'd like to take the first five to six uh, samples of people that would signify whether they do have a written financial plan or they don't. Am I audible? Salam alaikum to learn. Okay. Okay, please feel free to help um self share your on, on the chat group. Um and I think it's important for us to establish a baseline of where we are starting from um, in terms of this journey for financial freedom. I think one of the first things to think about, so my, my approach would be to take a very short presentation, probably about 20 minutes or less, and then open it up for conversations because I feel like a lot of the, a lot of the messages and the meat of the conversation will come in the conversation uh, and people can ask questions and to the best of my knowledge, I will get us of a like and answer, um, you know, within that context. So we'll just run through the slides um, very quickly and give enough room for a conversation at the end of it. So the first is you have to discover why money is important to you. Um, for a lot of us, it is, you know, to be able to help the deen and support Islam and support our family and our brethren. Uh, but, you know, that has to be articulated because when there's no why, two things happen. First, we are, could be tempted in the chase of money for the sake of money in itself. And that doesn't no one any good. So the first thing about money that you have to understand or financial influence is that it's not an absolute in its own. It doesn't give joy in absolutes. It doesn't give happiness. It cannot be replaced. It can, money cannot buy all the other things that make life important to all of us. So chasing money or chasing an accumulated number of wealth in of itself is not success. So we have to be able to then sit down and then say, why is it important to have this money? What kind of money do I want to have saved? What are my financial goals and aspiration? Uh, and what kind of wealth, in what shape do I want to have it? Uh, a lot of times it doesn't actually make sense to hold things in money, in, in fact, in, in pure cash. So do you want to hold it in real estate? Do you want to hold it in equity? Or do you want to hold it in investments? Or do you want to hold it in an Islamic trust? So these are some of the options um, that you have to think about when you're looking at it. But you have to understand what is the reason why you want to have this wealth. Because when, as you go through that journey and as we accumulate that wealth, that will continue to be a cardinal for us to then be able to then say, you know, what are we doing? Are we doing more or less of what we have anticipated at the beginning? The second is why, why, why do we also value money also? And, you know, the, you know, a lot of us, when we think about money, um, the re you know, almost all of us, if a psychologist have, have the opinion that all of us associate money to certain things that have happened in the past, in our past life, primarily our children. So some people come from a household where nobody talks about money um, and the conversation around money brings a lot of agitation and that kind of influences how we behave. 
some people come from a, a home where we've never needed money everything we've always had had always been around you know Allah has always provided in abundance for us as a household and then we go on in life thinking that is a given almost as an entitlement mentality and then say at any point when i need money i'll be able to get it and that influences our choices on how we behave uh, some of us also come from households where money causes a lot of strains um you know we've gone through quite a bit of difficulty you know growing up and, and the financial situation growing up sometimes it's been at home sometimes it's been right outside you've left home and then you've had to work and, and defend for yourself. And those things shape how we behave and how we react with money. Um, being able to understand and acknowledge um, this reality then helps us manage our behaviors and our dispositions um, as we then go on to our financial, to build our, our journey towards financial freedom. Uh, we want to be a point where we're not the kind of people that, you know, two is over, my man, and my brother, and my man, Kora, gone out. I'm already, at the end of the month, by the way, didn't pay, Sapa Basi Bere, and my brother, and Kora. So, you know, these things come from where we are. Once you can acknowledge it first, then can now start to say, how can I manage and how can I be a better person, um, you know, in the context of where there are many marriages that are being challenged, not just because of the lack of financial freedom, but because of how the partners have reacted to in the presence of that lack. So the lack of money is not, you know, the what is shaking the crux of the marriage itself. It's actually the way people react when they're in that position. Um, so one of those funny things that I discovered personally in the past was that when I am down to a few cash, you know, when I have a few thousands or a few tens of thousands with me, I always want to prove to myself that I have money. Like I'm not, I'm not broke. So what I would end up doing is I make the worst financial decisions. I spend the most recklessly when I'm down to my last cash because I'm just trying to prove to myself that, you know, I'm not broke. I'm not broke. I'm not broke. I'm not broke. So rather than just acknowledge and say, look, you know, I'm down to my last forty thousand or fifty thousand. I have another ten, twelve days to go for the rest of the month. Um, it looks like we have to go into austerity measures and try to ration our needs. I get into that point where you then go and spend and go and buy that e tree, eat, eat at the e tree, or, or buy something that makes you feel good. And you want to replace that lack of finding with a feeling of having. But in a lot of times when we do things like that, it just brings about even more uh, our misery. So we have to assess our situation, understand where we are and then make a plan that is realistic within the context of what we want to achieve. You know, the, you know, I remember when I was going into the university, my dad told me one of those things, he said, don't follow the Joneses. Uh, following the Joneses is uh, just following the hard effects. And this is, sounds very easy, but, um, you know, research and scientists have shown that over 75% of our financial actions uh, or, or investment actions are based on hard effects. People say that it is okay to invest in Bitcoin or to invest in cryptocurrency. And then I followed them to say, to invest. People talk about a halal or a sukuk as an investment. I've never read about sukuk. I don't understand what the different types of sukuks are. I don't know. I've not even checked what the regulators of sukuks are. I follow and I invest in Sukuks. So you have to, you know, we have to first always take a pause and then say, why am I doing this? What is the impact of this? For how long am I committing this money? Um, what is the time value of money and what are my alternative choices if I don't make this decision? So following, and it, you know, it is also the same, even probably more severe when you look at it from the cost side, how can we, how do you follow uh, our brother, brother, brother Blafiz has bought a car, uh, sister something is not driving an SUV or, or brother Gabriel has moved to Lekki. And then we, without really looking at our financial position, our other commitments and what our budgets 
or financial plan looks like. We follow that ad effect and we replicate the cost structure that we don't have a revenue uh, 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 that can match. And then we put ourselves into this kind of screens. So very important that we are able to define social norms, um, you know, read, research, investigate, consult widely, and then make decisions that we feel proud of. So even when you make a bad decision, you would know that you have made one that does make sense. Uh, another very important point here is time is more valuable than money. Um, so in fact, if people will say that, and this is, if you want to really understand this, think of it as a billionaire. Uh, why does a billionaire, it is faster for a billionaire to get to his second and third billion than it is for anybody to get into his first billion. So the reason is that when you get to that point where you have a billion, you have the capacity to pay for anybody's time. And then rather than only you working, you have the capacity to employ other people and then essentially buy their time and pay them cheaper than the value that they're creating for you. If you understand this, the value of employment, the, the way employment works is that somebody pays you 10 naira because you can create 25 naira of value. So I'm paying you 10 naira, I'm paying you 15 naira because you're going to create value of 25 to 30 naira for me. So if I'm able to employ a thousand people that are creating 20, 20 you know, dollars or 20 naira more value, 20,000 naira more value times a thousand people, that starts to then see how much more I can be able to build wealth. And that's the ingenuity about building businesses, having a startup and growing your startup into uh, big organizations because you are able to spend time, look at people that are good and can create value, have a synergistic relationship to the rest of your team, bring them on board. And then essentially one plus one is more than three. So being able to orchestrate that and buy other people's time is one of the surest and best ways to accumulate. But on the other side, we also have to then, you know, if we are on the employee side or we are on the essentially selling our time uh, for money side, understand, you know, the implications of what we spend our time on. Understand the implications both from a, uh, uh, first from a financial standpoint, are we being compensated adequately and fairly? Second is that, does this give, beyond the financials, does this give us fulfillment and satisfaction? Because it's not, it's not, it's not worth it spending most of our time around work, around our professional career, but then we don't have fulfillment, we don't have satisfaction in what we do. I feel it's, a thought, it's just a pass-through. The thought is that what is the role of how we spend our time um, in terms of our, you know, our, our being closer to, our creator and, and helping the cause of Allah. Um, does our work in any way help out that cause or does it take us away from, from, from that cause? So these things are extremely important that we look at, particularly as we make career choices or we make choices to move uh, from one role to the other. The other thing about money is that what, you know, in finance we like to call time value of money, which essentially says that money today is better than money tomorrow. Right, and this, this while the absolute context of time value of money from an interest bearing point is, um, is, is Aram. So you can't look at money as a store of value uh, from an Islamic standpoint. You also cannot earn over time from money. But you can look at it and say, if I go into this venture and I have an early payout, that payout, I can reinvest it, and that can generate another generation of wealth. So every every money spent uh, or every money not earned, it's a generation of wealth not earned. Let me explain. Um, if you look at the, the, the rules of compounding, which says that if I'm able to generate, let's say I have a business that gives me 100,000 naira every month. So let's say I invested in the Marua and every month they give me a hundred thousand naira, hypothetically, or an Uber and they give me a hundred thousand every month. Now, if I have 10 Uber cars, meaning that every month I get a million, meaning that every three months I can buy another car. So I started with 10 Uber cars, each of them give me a hundred thousand. That's a million in a month. By month three, I have three million, I can buy my 11th car. 
it means that by the end of year one, I have how many cars? 11 plus four, right? I would have bought one for three months, another three months, another three months. So I have 14 cars. Now, remember that for the first quarter of the following year, I now have 14 cars making money. So rather than N111, I now have 14 cars, 1.4 million every month, rather than 1 million every month. So if you look at it now, what it took me three years in year one to be able to buy a new car, three months in year one to be able to buy a new car, we then now becomes two months. Because once I have 1.4, 1.4, that is 2.8, I can get a second car. Meaning in year one, I'm able to buy four more cars. In year two, I'm able to buy six more cars. And then by the time I get into year three, I then have 16 cars. So that's sort of how you have the compounding effect of money, that if you end this tranche of money early on, it is better on ending that money in the later on. Let's assume somebody else, for instance, that said, rather than have this 100,000 monthly, then says, I'll give you my car. Um, I'll give you these 10 cars, so two for lease, and then you pay me once in a year. And then after 12 months in December, somebody brings out 1.2 million naira. Yes, you have 1.2 million naira, but you've lost a year of being able to compound that same money over time. So that's where the time value of money um, comes in from an Islamic point of view. You know, we all talk about financial freedom, um, and this is sort of kind of a subjective view. Um, it's not about, you know, having the kind of money that says I'm not going to work again. It says it is sort of thinking of it from a view of how do I get to a point where what I do is because I want to do it, not because I have to do it, where we are able to then control the choices we make uh, from a point of view of how does it affect us? Um, how, how, how does it affect us and how does it affect our, our, our choices that we make? Um, you know, how does, how do we, how do we have the flexibility of saying, I want to do this and now I want to go and lecture or now I want to go for, um, for, for Dawa for two weeks and then I'm going to go back or I want to go with all the day for the, with the family or I want to go on Umrah. So that points where you have that kind of flexibility to be able to do the things that matter to you and give you joy. That is financial freedom. Um, and here it is very important to say success, you know, the way I like to think of success is, you know, like a fraction. So it is what I achieve over what I decided to achieve. So if you take two uh, scenarios, for instance, and brother A says, I want to get in the next three months, in the next three months, I want to make 10 million naira. Right, and then is able to achieve nine million out of the ten. You know, theoretically, that is ninety percent achievements. And then you have what I that says, "I want to make five million, and is able to achieve five million out of the five. That is a hundred percent. Now, you know, this is not life is not an absolute. But if you look at it, who has been more successful? The brother that made nine out of ten, or the brother that makes five out of five? The answer is we can't tell. But success is a function of what you achieve divided by what you have set out for yourself to achieve. It is not what I achieved compared with what my brother, what my fellow brother has, or what that, or, or what that fellow colleague in the office had. It is not. It is all up to you, and then up to you to be the best you can, be prepared for any opportunity that comes, and make the best use of it. Uh, both with the mindset of success in this life and in the year after. When we want to set out our financial planning, we have to understand our starting point. Now, when I think about it, something I always ask my colleagues, or I very often ask at interviews, um, or when I'm advising my, my younger colleagues is to say, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? Uh, you must, you must, especially if you, with the, with the context of a professional career, you must set out your five-year plan and your 10-year plan. And the way financial planning and career planning works that we're not expecting that you're going to be a long run. It's not 
it's not necessary that you're going to achieve all of those things or you will not achieve even three times or 10 times more than those. It is the fact that you have a cardinal and then you have a destination in mind. And the fact that the clarity of that destination starts to then create a path where you can then follow to achieve that. So, you know, if I wanted to study it and then you then say, okay, where do I want to get to over the next 10 years? And you have a clear picture of where you want to. Then every year, every six months, every quarter, you can then go back and then say, where am I vis-a-vis -vis where I wanted to be? Where am I as a continuum? Where am I vis-a-vis -vis where I was last year? Where am I vis-a-vis -vis the people that are above me and the people that are below me? And how can I put that into context um, to, make, to make these things work for you? So again, back to the first point where I started. Um, if we don't have a written financial plan, it is important that we do have a written financial plan and just spend a lot of time and think about it and say, what do I want to achieve in five years? What do I want to achieve in 10 years? What does that make day look like? What does October 1st, 2033, 2032 look like for me? What does October 1st, 2027 look like for me? And what do I want that day to look like? Where do I want to be? Where do I want to be working? What do I want to have in financial savings? What kind of assets do I want to have? How much is my zakat should my zakat be? And those could be cardinals that can help you, um, you know, determine what your financial plan is and what your path to it. Once you then have that clarity, then go back and say, where am I today? And what do I need to do to get from where I am to where I need to be? And this is not a two hours exercise. It's not a 10 hour exercise. It is something you spend a lot of time and a lot of um, prayer over for Allah's guidance. And once you have it clearly written out and you have the plan, then it's easy to then start to build towards it. Now, the other part to note is that, you know, there's one form line in, in, um, in accounting that kind of set things out. Um, so when you look at your networks, right? Um, so, you know, the, the first formula is asset, is equals to liability plus owner's equity. Again, I you know thanks for the comments on mathematics, but um, as engineers, we we need to use that that the number strength to our advantage. So when we, you know when you look at when you look at this formula, right? If you take the if you take the liabilities to the other side of the of the equation, you would have net worth plus liabilities is equal to all your assets. Now, typically there are two ways to finance your assets, right? Assets are the things that you own, your car, your house, um, you know, your, 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 the mosque you build, every other thing that you have um, in your name that you own. Now, there are two sources of those, of those, uh, of financing those assets. One is your net worth, which is how much you have earned, your annual income, um, less your expenses, your savings and your investments, all of those things put together. The second part is your liabilities, which is what are the money you owe? How much indebted are you? Uh, particularly if you're a business person, you know what you own and what you've invested into the business and the profits you've made. You may also have other partners that are participating in the business and have co-invested to fund it. And you have to then understand that all this net, uh, this um, your net worth, and your liabilities on all your assets. Now, a very critical part to think about it is that what percentage of everything you have is your net worth versus what percentage is liabilities. And there's no right or wrong answer. It just means that if you are like Nigeria, I don't know if you remember I seen the budget of Nigeria for 2020. <laughs> Not sure what the is coming from. I mean, if you could help us mute um, where the source of the noise. Uh, I'm not sure if we've all seen the budget. Oh, thank you. If you've seen the budget of Nigeria for 2023, so we want to spend 23 million and we'll earn only 10 trillion out of that. So we have a 50% budget deficit. It means that for every 20 trillion of things that we are buying as a country, 
we are only contributing half of it, the other half would have to borrow from the market. Then you have to then say, am I borrowing short term or am I borrowing long term? So in the US or UK, if you're taking a, an Islamic mortgage or, or a financing, you'll be able to get things that are up to 10 years or up to 15 years uh, to repay. You know, if you're taking an Islamic kind of finance here, most of the times, even if you're eligible that you can get, either for business or for personal purposes, what you'll be entitled to get is going to be three months, six months, maximum one year to repay, maybe two years if you're extremely lucky. Now, uh, what happens is that when you have short-term liability, um, you have short-term payments, it distorts your management, it distorts your ability to focus. Those are where you have liquidity problems because you then have grown into a situation where you're now using a new loan to offset an existing loan, and that increases your cost. It also then goes back to reduce your net worth because what you would have used and you'd have made as your profit, you now have to share it with the providers of debt. So this is very important that we use. Ideally, what you want is our net, our net worth is our total asset less our liabilities. Now we want to make liabilities as small as possible in comparison to the assets we have. Um, or where we can get the liabilities, we get liabilities that are not uh, interest bearing. And this is where Alan yeah. said that, you know, Uzri is forbidden for us Muslims. Because when you then have interest earning um, liabilities, it further erodes, it's like, it's like, um, it's like, um, Corrosion, uh, uh, what's it called? When 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 steel starts to have um, uh, corrode, you know, it reduces the beauty, it reduces the quality, and it starts to break it from within. So the ability for us to be able to find innovative ways, and this is a true re restriction for Muslims, but there are so many, you know, Islamic banks out there. There are so many Islamic financial products and investment opportunities out there where we can both increase our assets, but also take some liabilities from to increase our net worth as well. I think I talked about the gold seeking. Yeah, this is a very, very important part of, um, of, of us. Now, I am an Egypt boy, and so this this part of not spending money comes naturally to me. Uh, but for, for a lot of us, it's something that we've had to learn growing up, or some of us are still trying to learn. Um, you know, first is how can you manage your expenses? Cut your expense, cut your quotes according to the cloth available, not according to your size. How can you then come out and then say that these are the things, this is how much I have to, and one rule in doing this, and this is very difficult, but if we can, but also very easy to, to, to adopt. First is that you, you, you spend what you've not invested. You spend what you've not invested. If you earn 300,000 or as a household, oh, no. you combinedly mm -hmm. earn 600 or a million naira. First is what's your investment goal? Mm -hmm. How much do you want to invest on a month on month basis? Now, after you've removed that investment, you then come back to fitting your expenses within that. And I know that, you know, um, you know, for a lot of people that are earning the day certain um, income, this may be very a, a lot more difficult than people that have a bit more. But in Nigeria of today, if your combined household income um, is above 600 to 700,000 in a month, then you do have an opportunity to be able to spend, to invest between 20 to 25,000 um, of that. Um, also, depending on your, on your, the age of your family, your dependents and all of that things. But you have to create a cautious, a conscious habit of investing and spending what you've not invested. One very good way to do that is to use uh, uh, this savings and trust where five or six brothers come together and every month somebody takes out, especially where you can't even remove from. So, so immediately the salary eats, you have to pay your adjour. And then once the adjour is paid, you have to then spend only what is available. Then when it's your time to take your adjour, you can then take it and then you can now use it for something specific because it comes from one lump sum. And that's a very good way to save. Now that's not investment, that's savings, but I think that's a topic for another day. Uh, it's also extremely important that we document what we spend. Um, these days of uh, 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 mobile, 
mobile money, ATM cards. ATM cards are, are all are all uh, a, a fit now. It is so easy to spend money today than it is to make the money back. And if we're not very careful, you find out that you just follow the Joneses, you spend a lot of money, and then, you know, there's nothing to show for at the end of the day. This is another part is how can you optimize your nine to five? A lot of us are employed while a lot of us are also in business. Either way, what are your alternative sources of income? Is it going to come from investments? Is it going to come from consulting, selling the skills you have? Is it going to come from, in Nigeria, we don't have the luxury of being able to do two jobs in a day. Uh, but how can, it could also come from you improving and investing in yourself and increasing your capacity to earn. So rather than, you know, have a promotion every two or three years, if you're able to do additional certifications, professional exams, take additional courses, improve your capacity to deliver, maybe you earn even faster and you grow faster in the organization. So, you know, there, there's so many ways to do this. Ultimately, we have to focus on how can we make the best use of our time, understand that whatever we want to achieve in risk call has to come from our time that we've been given and blessed by allow it. And then the more we can diversify the number of income streams we have, the better we are, inshallah. Now, all of this are good, but it's only as good as what you put to use. Um, and these things are very, you know, some of them, you know, they're very easy to talk about. And we all know these things. But the question is, how much of that are you going to put to use today? How much of that are you going to put to use this month? And how do you want to change your behavior to, um, to money, but also your, your perspective and your outlook for financial freedom? Thank you, Jazakumar. for that really um, knowledge feed session. Uh, for me, I've indeed learned a whole lot, and I'm sure that's the same for uh, virtually everyone of us on this um, session. Uh, indeed, um, our speaker has taken us through a journey of uh, financial planning, how to concept of financial freedom, financial stability, importance of earning, trying to maximize your earning capacity, and there's just a whole lot that um, I think from now is just left to put them into action. Really can't um, over appreciate our lecturer for that um, really insightful session. We pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you in abundance of goodness. I mean, uh, very briefly, I'm very confident that we would have a number of us would have questions. I mean, in the chat box, we've seen lots of comments like you taking us through the calculus of success, engineering maths in understanding, compounding wealth, and the whole lot. So um, we will just briefly uh, take some questions because um, time is not really by our side and we want to try to maximize the time we have left. So if you have questions, you could kindly signify using a name of the reaction button or you just um, drop your questions via the chat box. Our lecturer is indeed available to give answers to them. So if you have questions, you can either signify so the host would unmute you or you perhaps just send your questions via the chat box. Okay, I want to assume perhaps um, we want to ask our questions at a later time. I think that's the best time to ask our questions because we'll get a, a real time response. <laughs> um, if you have questions, you could send via the chat box. And um, if I get no response, I want to assume that um, aspects of questions mean that um, we properly digested all that the lecturer has said. Okay, I think the question just dropped in the chat box. So um, Mr. Ibrahim Lawal asked that, um, what is the most common thing you have noticed people miss when doing a financial plan? So here's the question. Yeah, so I'm like, not to last. I'm like, not right, Ibrahim. So I think it's um, people use, People limit their capacity to dream because of their context today. So it's like, um, so when you're doing financial plan, you have to do what is called like a big, hairy, audacious goal. Like it has to be big, it has to be hairy, it has to be audacious, and then it has to be really big. Now, most of the time we set the limitation on what we would achieve because we look at where we are, 
look at everybody that is around us and we use that to then say, this is what I want to do. Second is that we also share two short-term goals. So if you say what well, you've set up a financial plan for six months or a financial plan for two years, it is too short a time for things to happen and for you to really orchestrate change. So typically it's a lot better we start early in life and we start setting these things out. But it's also extremely important that we look out into like a five, seven, eight, ten year horizon when we're setting out these plans. But I think what I see the most common is people limit the capacity of what they can achieve in life by setting very small goals. Um, that's what I've seen the most common. So the risk of not having um, a financial plan is like, what's, what's the analogy I can use? Um, so it's, it's you know, let, let, me, let me answer the, the other side is the advantages of having a financial plan. And I'll try to answer this more precisely. If, have you ever wanted to buy a car and then your mind is in that sort of, cam, you know, Camry 2020, 2021 model, gray color, right? And then for some reason, you just start to see a lot of that car. It's like everywhere you drive, there's one Camry 2021 model gray color. And then it's like, how come now that I have said I want to buy this car and this color, it looks like every car on the road looks like that color. There's the way the mind works, you know, particularly from a psychological standpoint, that when you have your something very well defined, you notice a lot of it. Statistically speaking, you can see a lot of the opportunities. So when you have a financial goal and you say, I want to do this, the fact that it's carrying you and it puts you on your edges and you're thinking about it constantly, anytime there's an opportunity that can take you closer to your financial goal, or even maybe drop you down even. You are very much aware of it. You take note of it, and then it's easier for you to act on it. So it increases your chances. It's almost like, you know, the fact that we have our mindset at something, and then we pray about it, and then we make it, you know, you know, it's almost like God makes it happen for us. Then you have a lot more of the serendipity moments that comes and you're like, wow, wow, wow. It was like you had seen this coming. So that is the advantage of having a financial plan because it then helps you to take note of a lot more opportunity, be a lot more prepared, and be able to capitalize on those opportunities when they come. When you don't have a financial plan, there's the ease of you first judging yourself to say you've not done very well because you're not, you've not had the defined goal. So it's not very easy for you to then see progress. Uh, second is that it also gives sometimes a room where you're just going elta skelta and not necessarily just a lot of motion without movement, if you understand what I mean. Um, and this happens very much in our career. May Allah, may Allah make things easy for us. So how can one manage <laughs> effect of inflation on one's financial goal, age saving to buy a set back? A number of a number of reasons why, um, you know, and it's 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 tempting not to talk about this, but one of the one of the strategies there has to be jackpot on the list. Like you have to, in your scenario analysis, jackpot has to be number two or or number three, you know, with, with where Nigeria is, unfortunately. And we hope things get better, inshallah, for all of us and for the country. Uh, but then, you know, first is also saving, saving in um in 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 in, in US dollars. I'll, I'll 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 tell a personal example of something that I've gone through this month particularly. So I'm doing something and I need a lot of dollars to do it. Um, in the last two months, I, in the last two years, two and a half years probably, I've saved everything I want to save that is not an active investment um, in dollars. Like sometimes it's just, I'm traveling, I don't need the cash, I go and collect my BTA, I put it. Sometimes it's like I have cash, I'll buy. Sometimes even when I've bought, I remember there was a particular someone that had gotten dollars, he didn't need it, he wanted to sell it. And this was when dollar just moved up to like 560, right? And it seemed like dollar was, this was about 18 months or, or a year ago. And it seemed like 560 was very expensive because it was moving from 480, 470 to 560. And I was like, ah, man, a dollar 560 buy. And I was like, if this man will collect 550, I'll buy. And I bought like 5,000 or $10,000 from that from that from the from the brother uh, from the man then at 550 now the last batch of 
or that dollar that I was now, when I know I wanted to have a dollar expense uh, this month, I now had to pull all those savings back. I had some of the dollars I bought were lie at 400. I had some at 450, some 550, 560, a lot of it at 600. The last tranche I bought, I bought at 742. So imagine how much I have saved against inflation that I've saved, you know, just by investing against in, in dollar. And that's one of the advantages that you have. Um, and it's not a, you're not trading currency. You're just saving in a currency that gives you a hedge against inflation. And I don't think that is that is allowed. Trading currency and actively buying and selling. So let's say now you have dollar. And because we are reading, you read one month ago that euro is going to co is coming down. You now go and sell your dollar and buy euro and keep it. And when euro is going against the dollar, you trade it back again. I think that's what is frowned at point. But allow, allow. So that's that's the other strategy. Uh, the fourth is that there are certain asset classes that are kind of um, beat inflation. So investing in mutual funds is one. Investing in commodities is another one. And here, you know, caveat is that I run a commodities exchange. We have a COMEX trading platform. So, you know, here's an opportunity for paid adverts. Uh, but commodities actually do have a natural edge against inflation. Because if you think about it, when there's inflation, how do you feel it uh, first as a person? The price of rice, the price of maize, the price of gary. And those are inflationary effects. Um, and those are the kind of income you will get if you're investing against that same, uh, those same commodities uh, with a com trade commodities exchange. Uh, what are the microeconomics factors to be considered in making personal finance? So first, inflation is definitely one. Exchange rate is another extremely important one. Uh, you want to look at growth, right? So if you look at uh, because essentially you want to be growing faster than the economy as an individual. So if Nigeria is growing at six, seven percent, you must also be investing in assets that are growing faster than faster than that rates to to also be keeping your your share of income. Um, when you also look at things, if you're looking at a five year horizon or a ten year horizon, um, it's also good to look at the political economy and look at stability, and that is where sometimes it is easier to put the concept of Japa into Japa into perspective. Uh, if you look at things in um, sort of like 2010 to 2015, there was a huge, massive inflow of people that had traveled out, went abroad, and were coming back in. And that was because for, you know, for a long time, we had a lot of volatility in the exchange rate, and we're able to keep the exchange rate at sort of that 120, 180 range for a very long time. And the economy was growing, new jobs were being created, and people were interested in coming back to the country. Um, the question then, you can, it is then it's kind of easy to situate one strategy to say, am I going on a, I am going to go and get prepared in this next four, five year cycle, and hopefully things get better you know, because economy goes in, in sort of cyclical moments. So we have gone through it down, but probably we'll get into a high. And do I want to go and get new skills so that as the economy starts to go back in high, I come back or am I going and going um, and, you know, sort of living there, you know, for like relocating permanently or, or do I want to stay we stand this next sort of three, four years and hope that things will have a turn around. So this kind of analysis becomes very important uh, from a macroeconomic standpoint um, when you're looking at a five, 10 year financial plan horizon. If you're doing one year, two years, everything looks bleak or everything looks great. And it's not also, that's also one of the disadvantage of doing very short financial planning. Allow, allow. Salam alaikum tuma. For that. And uh, I couldn't have imagined a more concise response than what you have um, given. We ask a lot for the enriching knowledge and um, beneficial wisdom. I mean, and um, it's important we see this again that we are very related to, you know, how do you, you know, run us through this session of financial planning, a very sacrosanct um, aspect of every individual's life, which um, you able to help us understand it better and it has been really exposing we ask a lot of other enriching knowledge as I've earlier stated. So inshallah we know that um, you know we have moved past time and uh, we need to 
um, take in. So for those who would have um, more questions, I think we can reach out to engineer Saband. He could help us get across to the lecturer and um, give responses to that. Uh, we are going to um, be taking no other questions currently. And we shall move forward to next on the agenda, which is the um, vote of thanks. And that will be given by engineer Saba. Engineer Saba, are you with us? Hello? Yes, we, we, yes we, can, we can hear you now. Yes, I hear you now. We lost you for some seconds. Hello, Basso. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I said engineer Saba. So we wanted to take give us okay. um take us through the vote of thanks. So uh we give thanks to our last one over Allah. We thank our guest speaker, Ayote Jibalogo, for that wonderful lecture. Uh, this is the second uh, lecture that we are having Ayote Jibalogo delivered in this year edition of our professional development forum. So we we'll appreciate your gesture, we we'll appreciate the lecture, we we'll appreciate sacrificing your time out of your very tight and busy schedule to deliver this lecture. We pray to Allah to continue to grant your heart's desires and we pray to Allah to continue to make uh, you successful. So you are our alumni and you're also uh, leading a, at the moment, a multinational organization that is indigenous in Nigeria. So we pray for your success. We pray that Allah will tell us one time his mercy, guide you guys in all your decision making. Uh, send to you the best of things that would help you achieve your dream, just like he sent uh, Harun to Musa Ali Salah, and he sent Lufti companions, the Abu Bakri, the Umo, uh, to the Professor Salah to support his mission. We pray on my telegram to that set of uh, individuals too that will make you achieve the dream and make you successful in all your endeavors. We say Jazakumullah Khayyan. And on the second note, this session marks the end of our PDF session for the year 2022. We appreciate all our attendees. We appreciate all the participants. We appreciate all our lecturers as well that have delivered lecture one way or the other to you all with each other. And inshallah, looking up an improved session for 2024. So the committee will be going to the table at the moment to review all the session and see what we can do better. So feel free to reach out to us to share with us your opinion, your ideas, and what we can do to make this uh, session better for our next year, session 2024. May all my tell us to solve our life if beyond that time. To you all, I say, Jazakumullah On behalf of the committee, uh, we say thank you to every member of the association, uh, every participant, every lecturer, every invitees, and all, uh, all over the board, people that have participated in our sessions in one way or the other. We say Jazakumullah Khaya, we all might tell you to you about that. Assalamu alaikum to your partners. Wa alaikum assalam to your Indeed, um, we can only pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward um, everyone, and especially those that um, they put in a lot of efforts towards planning this highly um, rich um, program. So we ask Allah to reward them abundantly. And to everyone that has been a part of this, we equally pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, bestow upon us his mercy and blessings. I mean, uh, very quickly, we shall move to the last of the agenda, which is to take a closing prayer. So I want to humbly um, invite uh, one of our brother, brother Thani Abdurrahman, to give us the closing dua. So Rathani, please go down, meet yourself and give us the closing to her. All right, so uh, Alhamdulillah, we give thanks to Allah who has made it, um, who has made it, uh, oh, sorry, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can, we can clearly. All right, so we give thanks to Allah and Allah who has made it possible for us to have a wonderful session like this. And um, as we wrap this particular um, PDF series, we that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his barakah in it. We ask that he blesses each and every one of uh, the participants who have been attending since day one and the facilitators amidst all the organizers. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and grant them all their desires. So let's jointly recite Surah Al Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki Al-Jiyah, 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 Al-Jiyah,
اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين سو ان شاء الله for those who had uh, missed some sessions we can go to youtube and just um, simply search las mega then we get to you know watch or have a recap of the previous sessions and um I just want to reassure that indeed um, there have been lots of very exciting sessions that has been held in the past. So not to miss out on this, we can just kindly have a recap of those sessions on YouTube. And for those who probably um, we still want to, you know, we are here and we still want to probably have a recap of this very session, it has been recorded and it will be uploaded on YouTube for us to consume. Rascal has to make that an easy one and we can only pray that um, all that we've learned, uh, we, it will be beneficial in terms of putting them into practice and we see measurable reward on them. Um, inshallah, this shall be the end of the EPF session and um, uh, we ask Allah to reward us for our efforts all through.